Welcome to Sunday worship at Discovery Church. Um, Merry Christmas. It's good to be here, um, to be gathered as a church in person in the building for some of us and for online for others, um, but just to dwell in this time of Christmas tide, right? The time where we continue to celebrate the birth of Christ and just the, the gift and the love that was shown to us in that. Uh, as we join in worship, I invite you to join me in this call to worship. Uh, it's coming from Psalm 117. If we can all read the parts bold and yellow together, so why don't we stand and say this together? Praise, Praise the, the Lord, Lord, all you all nations. nations. Extol Praise him, all you peoples. peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Please join us in singing this morning. See 
each other both in person and online um, and yeah just welcome each other to worship this morning and pass the peace
stood a lonely kettle shed where a mother laid her baby in a manger for his men. Mary was the mother, mother. Jesus Christ. Thank you. 
invite you into a quiet minute, a chance to, to rest in to rest together but also alone with God um, as we just set aside whatever it is we bring with us and we set it in front of God and just be in his presence. Um, I'm going to start us with a passage, and I'll give some time just as a quiet minute. This is from Luke. Because of God's merciful compassion, the dawn from on high will visit us to shine on those who live in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And God, we need that peace. We need you to guide us to that peace. We need your light. We need you to shine on us. We just pray that you would show us your mercy, show us your goodness, and help us to to see you for who you are and for what you've done for us. And we pray for Pastor Paul now as well as he comes to deliver 
your message to us this morning. We ask that you will use his words, um, that you will prepare our ears, uh, prepare our hearts, and prepare our feet um, to be able to hear you, uh, to know you, and to, to go forward living for you today. We love you, God. Amen. Good morning. Before I begin uh, reading from Isaiah chapter 9, we want to dismiss Discovery Kids for their time downstairs. Your teacher and your helper will be there with you, and we're going to be dismissing Discovery Kids at this time. On this Sunday after Christmas, We reflect on the light of God that has come not just to the Jewish people, the land of Israel, but to all nations and to all people. And for our scripture reading this morning, it's found in Isaiah chapter 9. I'll be reading the first seven verses, and we'll be reflecting on some of the truths that Isaiah is bringing out and how that was lived out when Jesus Christ arrived as a baby. So I invite you to join with me by standing as we hear these words from the book that we love. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God's very word. Thanks be to God, and you may be seated. Light and darkness are polar opposites with completely different outcomes. We use it in our everyday lingo, a night and day difference. Darkness never leads anywhere, but the light always leads. Light at the end of the tunnel gives hope, while darkness in a tunnel by itself draws no one. Darkness hides the creatures at night, but the light in the night will attract them and draw them. We don't want to be kept in the dark by our doctor. We want things to be brought to light, because only in the light can one really get to the root of an issue. When the Jewish people returned from captivity in Babylon, and they built their synagogues. They wanted to make sure that the natural light would make its way inside, thus fulfilling the psalm, in your light, we see the light. Light is what is associated with God. 
God's hope, God's promise, is characterized by light. And so is the truth of Christmas. The unexpected, ultimate light of Jesus has come and is received by grace. The unexpected, ultimate light of Jesus has come and is received by grace. Isaiah describes God's rescue to humanity as a coming of light. And that light, as he begins chapter 9, is unexpected. The unexpected part hits with its reference to the regions of Israel. He uses the far-out regions, the regions of Naphtali and Zebulon, as a place where something big is going to come out of. It would not be in the headquarters of Jerusalem, down in Judah, but instead in the outskirts, Zebulun and Naphtali. I tease Renee, and she takes it very well about where it is that she came from, down on the farm. It's one of the few counties that still does not have a stoplight in the entire county. There is the country, the boonies, the sticks, and then where Renee came from. And that's Zebulun and Naphtali, or what we know as Galilee, the Galilee of the Jews. But the Galilee region in the first century, in the time where Jesus lived, you can sort of see it, the Sea of Galilee, was the part of Israel that was the multi-ethnic part of Israel. It was not the Jewish part that was farther in the south. The northern part is where the Jews and the Gentiles mingled together. And God is going to do something great in the outskirts, in the places where the more traditional Jews would not go because of the multi-ethnic part of Galilee. You might remember how that's played out in the first century in John's Gospel, chapter 1, when a future disciple of Jesus, when introduced to Jesus and finding out where he comes, came from, and that he came from Nazareth, you remember what he said. Nazareth. How can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth, Galilee, those regions were the bottom part of the pecking order. And yes, there was a pecking order back in the early days. Rome, that considered themselves the top of the top, used to use Jerusalem as the ones that they would peck down on. And so Jerusalem had to find someone that would be below them in the pecking order. And they picked out the region of Galilee. And Isaiah says that a big, important, religious, spiritual leader is going to come from this place? Yes. Because that's how God works. And the Christmas story was completely unexpected that this family from Nazareth, from the sticks, would have a child of great significance. Born not in comfort, but in a feeding trough. Born not as part of a middle class family, but to a poor family. And the visitors who came were not heads of state, but lowly, lowly shepherds. To a pregnant, unwed, teenage peasant girl who would be stigmatized for the rest of her life, as would her son. And he would carry that with him. Jesus did not have any of the markers that the world would look at to say, this person is going to be a success. In obscurity comes the Son of God, the most influential person in the world. Glory was going on, 
and nobody of significance saw it. Jesus didn't glitter. And it seems like our Christmas time is often full of glitter. I like glitter. I like lights in my living room. I like lights on my Christmas tree. But yet we need to remember that everything that is not gold does not glitter. I think that's how Tolkien put it. No, he put it, not everything that is gold glitters. That's how Tolkien said it, taking from Shakespeare and giving it a different twist. Because the Bible says, nothing that is of gold of this world glitters. And this world is all about glitter. If it's not the things that glitter, it's about credentials that glitter. It's about connections that glitter. It's about knowing the right people. It's about wearing the right clothes. It's about going to the right events. These are things that glitter to the world. And in Christmas, we must be reminded that those things that glitter in our society don't glitter to the mind of God. Let's keep that in perspective and learn how to regard people who are not the glittery people of society. People without the credentials. People not having the right accent. People not from wherever. Christ calls us to be able to respond with respect and love and grace to all people. Not to follow the pattern of our society that says, just honor those who glitter. Jesus didn't glitter. And God's hope came in unexpected ways and unexpected places, and he does the same today. And then comes the light. Jesus' coming was unexpected. It came in an unexpected place to unexpected parents. And his coming is called light, the ultimate light. Isaiah uses words that are translated the deep darkness. World outside of God's light is called a deep darkness. It's a compound word that Isaiah puts together. And it literally means, when we read it, the death shadow. A deep darkness of a death shadow is what the world is like without Jesus. Because light and life go together. They always have. Life is dependent on light. When God created in Genesis 1, before he creates life, he creates light. If the sun went out, and dissipated, never to return, the earth would go down to zero degrees by the end of the day. If it happened now, by the end of the year, we'd be at minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And we'd eventually level out at minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit without light. Photosynthesis would stop immediately and we would be in the deep darkness, in the death shadow. Why is it that in the creation story that God creates light day one and he creates the sun on day four? How could that be? It's because there is a light that is greater than the sun. In Revelation, when we get to the end, when God shares about the perfect world, the new heaven and the new earth, when all death and suffering are gone, when gone is injustice, gone is death, gone is disease, gone is aging, gone is the sun, because it says that God and the Lamb 
will be the light in the new heaven and the new earth. The ultimate light in which nothing dies or decays is found in Jesus. And that light has come. In fact, it's more than come. It says that that light has dawned. A light has dawned, it says in verse 2. Dawns are beautiful things, aren't they? I think these last couple of weeks we've had some beautiful dawns that have come. We think of a dawn as a gradual lighting of the darkness. The skies turn pink and orange before the ball comes up. It's not what that word means, dawn. He's literally saying a light has flashed, has flashed. Not a sudden turning from darkness to light, but a very sudden turning to light. And not even like a light bulb flashing, like the the old cameras where it would flash and be gone, but something that flashes and stays on. Something that appears and never goes out. And that's what that word means. It flashes suddenly and it stays on because now everything has changed. Isaiah was saying there is a Messiah coming and everything would change when that light flashes. And that light who came is Jesus. For given to Jesus are four titles at his birth. Titles that only God can have. Not divine-ish titles, but totally divine titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Things that are life-altering, shocking, game-changing. Tied to that light who is born and changed everything. And that's what we saw in the New Testament when we read, when people encountered Christ, they saw the light, they knew it as the true light of God, and it changed everything that they did. They gave to the light their highest allegiance. They sacrificed everything for him. They not only changed a few things in their life, they changed everything in their life when the light flashed in their life. They lived as if truly everything they had was on loan from God and they were to use it for his purposes. The ultimate light does that. Makes the difference in our lives for everyone to see. That's the kind of change that Isaiah is talking about. The deep darkness, utter darkness, And the light flashes and stays and changes everything. It's the meaning of Christmas. And when the first Christmas came, all of the words of Isaiah came together. Matthew gives us that clear picture, that picture of how God plays this out, starting with the Magi. And spreads to the nation. The Magi. They were the foreigners. Well, foreigners, but where did they come from? Well, there are, interestingly, three Old Testament passages. And in those passages, it says when the light comes, when the Messiah arrives, out of Sheba will come people bearing gifts. Out of Sheba. Some people still interpret that as Iraq or the Baghdad area. Others interpret it as the area of Yemen where the spices and the incense came from. People who are from completely different areas. And it says that they were magi. 
We call them kings, right? We three kings of Orient are. And we, we sort of know that they, they weren't kings. That word that is used is also used in the Old Testament. And it talks about leaders who were schooled in the occult. And magic. Even Daniel is called one of them. But he wasn't schooled in magic. He was schooled by God Almighty himself. But they served kings. They were advisors. They were ambassadors. But they were known as people of the occult. People from Sheba, strike one. People practicing the occult, strike two. And how do they fit in to the story? What's special about the Magi is that they are the unexpected guests. They are the ones that the Jews would never associate with because they practice the occult. And they are the ones who are truly out of place in this Jewish scene. And Matthew uses them to set the tone for the rest of his gospel. That these unlikely characters are candidates of God's grace. They are the ultimate outsiders. And to them, the light has flashed. The light has dawned. They weren't perfect. They had their faults. They had their flaws. They had their sins. But they came to Jesus and their life was changed. And he would continue to change lives. Jesus would have the same magnetic effect on Samaritan adulterers, on ostracized lepers, on greasy tax collectors on the take, on despised Roman soldiers, on immoral prostitutes, all those that good religious and righteous people would want to put to the side. They were drawn to Jesus. And what's special about the Magi? They are the first of the many of the outsiders who are drawn. And it's so wonderful that they were drawn because they saw the light in the sky. Maybe they were people of the Old Testament scriptures and they came upon Numbers 24 that says, I see him but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. And by the light, they came to the light. Renee and I went to a lecture at Cornerstone University from a professor there. Uh, And the professor was holding this position because they had found this ancient coin from back in the time of Caesar. An ancient coin that uh, portrayed Judea. And up on the top of the coin, on the bottom part was Judea, and up on the top of the coin, this unique coin, had a star. So unusual. Nothing like it in other coins that were printed back in the time of the first century. Could it really have been the Archaeologists who are not followers of God, when they found this coin, as they start to think and as start to go out in some of the papers, could it really be that there was a star that was shining in Judea in the first century? We know that star as Jesus, born of the Virgin, fully human but without sin, the spotless Lamb of God, straight from the throne of heaven. The sheep led to the shearers to be sacrificed for payment for our sin. So that anyone and everyone, no matter how greasy they are, if they would just confess their sin and repent and turn from it, they would receive Jesus, forgiveness and grace and God's new light. The great apostle in Ephesians chapter 2 put it this way. 
the late Eugene Peterson paraphrased it in his message like this. Now God has us where he wants us. With all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving us is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play a major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we had something to do with this whole thing. Nope. We neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. They came because of the light. That light flashed, and everything has changed since. So what does the story mean for us? What do we take from it? How do we live it? Well, it tells us about shining his light, about bringing his light in the darkness. A light not just once that will flash like the old light bulbs, but a light that flashes and stays on and endures. Shining his light. It talks about not only how God receives others, but how we also are to follow the same pattern of Christ and receive others. Those that we might want to see wounded. Those that maybe have hurt us. And those that are very different from us. Like the Magi were so different. Maybe there are people that we think they deserve what's coming to them. The kind of life that they live, they deserve what's going to come. And yet we are reminded that to all people comes the offer of grace. Those with shiny sins, those with deep, dark sins. We all need grace. We all need the light. And so God's grace that was shown in the Magi encouraged us to shine his grace for all because his grace has come to us. And when we demonstrate his grace in ways that people aren't expecting, the light flashes and it stays. And maybe something inside them will spark as they get a taste of the goodness of heaven that has come down to earth. And so we hope and we pray that the flashing light of our acts of grace will lead people to the light who is Jesus. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Father, how we bless you for your great light. Thank you for your plan of sending your light into the world. And that light still remains. Thank you that that light resides within us. Thank you that your light is at work around us. We pray, Father God, that we will carry your light into your world. Into the places of deep darkness. And we know that when the light comes... The darkness flees. We bless you for the light. We lift up those in our faith community to you who are in need of just daily touches of grace and light for Gail and Gil and Joe and Pam, that your grace and goodness would abound, provide for them the needs they have. And for others in our faith community, Lord, for Dan and Rosemary, for Sue, for Dale and Dot. We pray, Father God, that your light of grace and strength would rest upon them too. We lift to you, Nikki, and we pray, Lord, that you will bring the healing that she needs in her foot, 
We bless you for doctors, for meds, for casts. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will uh, bless her with healing. Father, also on this day, uh, we bless you for Elizabeth, Dean and Nikki's daughter, and she was born on this day. And many of us remember that story, Lord, where the birth was not easy. And Dean was preparing for the worst. And you, by your grace, you saved Nikki. And you brought Elizabeth safely into this world. We thank you for that remarkable act of grace. And we thank you that there walking testimonies of that grace of rescue for you have rescued us we lift our youth that you will protect their hearts and minds we pray lord that you will bless them in this time of rest and refreshment guide them lord as they look to the future sometimes just the Next semester is enough, but some look beyond. Pray, Lord, that you will even now be working in their hearts and their minds to grow that passion for how you want to use them to shine your light in vocation, in family, in friends. We pray for families that are struggling on many levels, and we pray, Lord, that you will provide for our families wisdom and grace and love and that it will be in abundance. We pray for our community, for our country and our world and the rise of this latest COVID surge. We not only pray for relief again, but we pray for your strength and care in the midst of this constant change. And we ask that you will lead your church to minister in ways that bring hope, that bring light, that bring your presence to all that we meet and serve. And please use this time of waiting to strengthen your people, that we will not slack off, but grow in fervor for our love and the encouragement we get from you, and to grow in your presence. Help us not to live our lives on hold, but to make the most of this time for your glory, for our growth, and our neighbor's good. May we keep showing your love to others as best we know how. We lift up our neighbors. Use us to shine your light of grace and love. This week we pray for our neighbors on 72nd Street. We pray an extra blessing upon them this week and that they might know that life's blessings come from you. We pray for our missionary partner, Bridge Street Ministries, this week. We bless you for young people who have shown all generations what it's like to follow the light, to live by faith, to be changed in all that they do. Protect their leaders, their staff, Surround them with the blood shield of Jesus. Bless them as they minister, not only in their neighborhood, but as you use their influence in other churches, in other communities, and even in other countries. We thank you for your grace. Bolster our resolve to live lives of love and kindness so that you are honored. We thank you again for the sacrifice of your son who makes all this possible. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone agreed and said, Amen.
please join us in singing this last song.
Thank you, Jacob. Emily, thank you. We have a few closing announcements for you uh, this morning, things that are happening uh, in the life of the Discovery family. Next Sunday, first Sunday of the year, and we're doing a little change that we've been communicating. We're going to be moving uh, the talk up earlier in our gathering time. And then so our closing time after is going to be a much more extended and longer. Same time frame period all together, but we're going to do a little uh, switch and see how that change goes in our worship time. And that begins uh, next Sunday. Uh, we also want to, to know that next Sunday being the first Sunday of the month is also Communion Sunday. So we'll be gathering as a family to remember the great sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf. Communion next Sunday. And then in the back, in the foyer, we have uh, the Christmas tree, which will, I don't know if that's going to get down this week. It might. But under the tree are places where you can put some uh, gently used winter gear. And the purpose of that is that we've made a connection with uh, uh, Wedgwood Christian Services and what they do to help their residents is that they provide jobs and opportunities for them to be shoveling, to be outside. I don't know if the shoveling is ever going to happen, but in case it does happen this winter, uh, they, they really are in need of like winter clothes and hats. There's information about that and Monday memos, but we'd like to take the next Sunday or two just to see if there are opportunities that the Discovery family has of gently used winter clothing that we might be able to help uh, our Wedgwood family out with. So uh, be, uh, be mindful of that as you go through your closets and look for some of the things. We appreciate that. Now receive God's parting blessing that the Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance upon you, smile down on you, wrap his arms all around you, and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.